Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland, and here I am on Parliament Square, London, in front of the statue of Benjamin Disraeli. Well, Disraeli needs some introduction these days. He was born in uh, 1805 in London. He grew up on Theobald's Road in a house that still stands. His father, Isaac Disraeli, was a noted scholar. Uh, the family made their, their fortune in hat manufacturing. And at that time, the family uh, put an apostrophe between the D and the I, so it was D Israeli, as in from Israel. Benjamin's grandparents had come from uh, Italy, so he was a Sephardic Jew. And they used to worship at Beavis Marks Synagogue, which was an Ashkenazi synagogue, as in founded by Dutch Jewish immigrants in the 17th century. Anyway, there was a row in the synagogue over some trifling matter, and Isaac Israeli uh, pulled his family out of the synagogue and had his sons baptized in St. Andrew's uh, Church, Holborn. Benjamin Disraeli was the oldest of three sons. His two younger brothers went to Winchester College. He went to a school which is not a notable one, does, doesn't exist anymore. It was a private school in the real sense, as it was run by someone for profit. It wasn't a charitable trust. The most expensive schools here, perhaps surprisingly, are charities, as in there's no profit motive, there's no, no shareholders. Anyway, his brothers went on to university and later became civil servants, were plodders. So when Disraeli was 18, he finished uh, school and he hung around his father's library. His father had thousands of volumes. His father had remained out outside of religion, despite his family having become Anglicans. And Disraeli then decided he wanted a political career. But up to the age of 30, he'd achieved almost nothing. Um, he toyed with uh, being um, a Whig or even a radical. Eventually, he plumped for being a Tory. Uh, so he got elected to Parliament on his fifth attempt, elected for Buckinghamshire. Um, so it wasn't a borough constituency, it was a county constituency. He'd been having an affair with an aristocratic lady. He tried to turn himself into a, something of a littérateur. But many people thought he was a dilettante, dabbling in literature, politics and goodness knows what else. Um, having an affair with an aristocratic lady rather old than himself. He finally got married, though he never had any children. Um, so uh, his uh, Judaic origins had been a distinct disadvantage to him. There was a considerable anti-Semitism at the time in this country. It mustn't be overstated. There had been no anti-Semitic murders in this country, as far as I know, since the 13th century. Uh, a uniquely good record in Europe. Um, and when he was standing for Parliament, people would shout Shylock at him, wave bits of bacon at him, saying, would you eat this? Are you really a Christian now? Um, anyway, he was very proud of his uh, Hebraic ancestry, saying he was uh, from a very noble race and he was the missing page between the Old and the New Testament. Um, so he rose fast. Uh, he was a man of uh, extraordinary oratorical abilities. However, his um, maiden speech in Parliament bombed, uh, and he was booed and hissed and forced to sit down and saying, well, you refuse to hear me now, but the time will come when you will listen. And indeed, it came true. So um, uh, one of the uh, salient issues of the late 1830s was repeal of the Corn Laws. There was the Anti-Corn Law League, which was mostly an extra-parliamentary body that had quite a bit of Whig support. Radicals were in favour of it, so was the um, Irish uh, Repeal Association. Um, but there was the Anti-League, led by the Duke of Chandos, and many um, of the great landowners set their face against the repeal of the Corn Laws. They were adamantine in their opposition to, to repealing the Corn Laws because they made so much money out of the artificially inflated price of corn. So uh, it seemed to be a very unjust thing that the poor should be paying over the odds um, for their daily bread, while uh, multi-millionaires were getting even richer because of it. Um, uh, so some said the Tory party stands for the landed interest, not the moneyed interest, but uh, manufacturing and to some extent banking and the insurance and so on, they were becoming more important than agriculture. And there was a repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846. Sir Robert Peel, uh, he led that, he was a Tory, and his disciple Gladstone followed him out of the party over that. Uh, so um, Disraeli led the charge against Peel and um, Gladstone accusing them of bad faith, saying they had betrayed the core principles of Toryism. It was utterly disgraceful. Um, some people suspected that Disraeli didn't quite believe what he said because uh, some years later he changed his tune. Well, the corners were gone and there seemed to be no mileage in trying to bring them back. Only a few backwoodsmen wouldn't, wouldn't recognize reality. So Disraeli, he later became leader of the Conservative Party because um, from about 1830 it was the Conservative Party, not the Tory Party. I mean, the word Tories are used interchangeably even now. John Wilson Croker invented the words Conservative Party in 1828. The Tamworth Manifesto of 1834 was what really emphasised as the Conservative Party. 
party had two leaders, one of the House of Commons, one of the House of the other, and the House of Lords, who was in the Commons for most of the time. So um, he was very briefly Prime Minister once, and then he came out for a second time in 1874, um, serving on until uh, 1880. So um, uh, what did he want to do? Well, the Artisans Dwelling Act, the Food and Drug Act, the condition of England is what he cared, cared about. His early novels like Coningsby, Tancred, Sybil and so on uh, suggested that uh, the, the aristocrats cared about the working class more than these emerging uh, capitalists, factory owners, mill owners, mine owners and so on. Um, for them it really just was all about hard cash. Um, it was profit and loss. Uh, now he had a very romanticised and I think bogus view of the Middle Ages. Not quite sure he believed what he was writing. Saying the castle is unsafe but the cottage is unhappy. Um, so uh, it seemed dribble to me because obviously aristocratic land landowners have been just as happy to exploit uh, the peasantry as uh, many industrialists were to exploit the pro proletariat. But there we are, it was bogus. Um, and uh, he brought in the Royal Titles Act so that Queen Victoria was hailed as Empress of India and then she sent her son, Edward VII, out to receive the homage of hundreds and hundreds of Indian princes at the first Delhi Durbar. Durbar could be translated palace. There they um, did obeisance to him. Uh, what else? He then was in ennobled as the Earl of Beaconsfield. I know it's pronounced Beaconsfield, but it's pronounced Beaconsfield. Later became a Conservative constituency, one of the most rock solid in the country. In 1982, a certain Tony Blair stood there in the Labour interest. Of course, you know he went down in flames. So uh, then, then his um, arch rival Gladstone came back into the fray. He'd been leader of the Liberal Party with his Midlothian campaign, saying that Disraeli is immoral. Um, and uh, he is um, in cahoots with the Ottoman Empire, who have butchered thousands of Bulgarian civilians. Anyway, 1880, um, Disraeli was ailing and he was voted out of office. Now, of course, he was in the House of Lords, he didn't lose a seat, couldn't lose a seat, but the Conservative Party lost power to the Liberals. Um, he was somewhat ill and he died the next year in Mayfair in a house that still stands. Uh, so his title went extinct with him. Uh, what else? The Primrose was said to be his favourite flower. Then the Primrose League was set up to advance Toryism. You can still uh, visit his country house, Hewenden Manor. So though he's very urban and uh, of recent foreign origins, he tried to reinvent himself as, a, as an English gent, as though he had aristocratic roots here going back centuries. So that's it. The Conservative Party is endlessly Prussian, um, forward-looking, and uh, the United Kingdom was probably unique in Europe in being a country where someone who was born Jewish could be accepted as Prime Minister in the 19th century, indeed leader of the Conservative Party. Conservatives in most other European countries was tainted with anti-Semitism. Um, so the Primrose League continued for some decades and later merged with other Conservative organisations. So that is Beaconsfield. Um, he's almost never known by his aristocratic title, but Disraeli.